right. Very good. In that case, it's time to open our Bibles together to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 20. 2 Timothy 2.20 for our message from God's Word this morning. 2 Timothy 2.20 will be located on page 1280 if you're using the church Bible this morning. This morning being August 13th, 2023. Our text this morning is going to begin in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 20 and go on down to the end of the chapter in verse 26. And the title of this morning's message is God does not live in a tiny house. <laughs> I hear that tiny houses are all the rage these days, and I'm sure God has nothing against them. He just doesn't choose to live in one. And we begin with the story of a man who brought his best friend home unexpectedly to meet his wife one day. And she said, you brainless idiot, my hair and my makeup are a mess. There's dishes piled in the sink, and the house is a disaster. Why in the world would you bring your best friend home? And the man said, because he's thinking of getting married. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking of houses, God does not live in a messy house. And he doesn't live in a tiny house either. At least that's what it says in 2 Timothy 2.20, where the Apostle Paul wrote these words. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, to begin with, we know that the great house it's talking about here is God's house by comparing what King Solomon said about God's Old Testament house in your first reference in 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, in 2 Chronicles 2 and verses 5, verse 5. The house which I build is great, for great is our God. King Solomon built God a great house that the Bible also calls what? Temple. The temple. And one of the reasons that he called the temple great is because the first definition of the word great in the dictionary is big or large. And Solomon did not build God a tiny house. <laughs> but today, God doesn't live in a temple made with hands. In your next reference, 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul talks about the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And he's talking about the church we read about in your next reference in Ephesians 1, 22. The church, which is his body. Today, God lives in a church called the body of Christ. A body of people. A lot of people. <laughs> 
that the Greek word translated great there in verse 20 is the word mega. <laughs> That's a word that we use to talk about a large number of things. Uh, your smartphone has a lot of megabytes of memory. And if you play the lottery, they want you to think that you can win mega millions, right? <laughs> now, the number of people in the body of Christ is small by comparison to the world's population but it's still a pretty big house with a lot of people in it and people are the vessels it's talking about there in verse 20 you may remember what the Lord said about Paul in Acts 9:15 after he saved him he said he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the reason God called Paul a vessel is because a vessel in the Bible is a container that holds things as you see when Elijah said in 1 Kings 17 10 Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. That vessel contained water. But Paul's body was a vessel that contained the Holy Spirit of God. Just like the bodies of all believers do. As you see in your next reference when Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6.19 Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. Now, if you do a word search for that, that word vessel in your computer or in your concordance if you want to go old school you'll find that Solomon's temple had a lot of vessels in it. Vessels that held water for all of their washings, oil for their lamps, ashes from the burnt offerings. And some of those vessels were made of gold and silver. And some were made of earth and wood. We read about the earthen vessels in Leviticus 14.5 where it says that the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel. Now that was for the tabernacle not the temple but we know they use the same vessels that they use in the tabernacle in the temple because later on when the king of Babylon stole the temple's vessels. Daniel told his grandson in Daniel 5, 22 and 23, Thou, Belshazzar, hast lifted up thyself against the Lord, and they have brought the vessels of the Lord's house before thee. And thou and thy lords have drunk wine in them and hast praised the gods of silver and gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone. And the God in whose hand thy breath is hast thou not glorified. Belshazzar was praising the gods that he thought made the materials that those vessels were made of instead of praising the God who really made silver and gold and wood. So, when Paul says in verse 20 of our text that the great house of the body of Christ 
has vessels of gold, silver, wood, and earth. We know that he's comparing God's house in the past to his house of today. That means some of us are vessels of gold and silver, and some of us are more earthy <laughs> and woody. But the first thing I want you to know about that is none of us are of any less value to God than any of the rest of us. That vessel of earth that we read about there was used to offer a bird as an animal sacrifices and listen. Those sacrifices were of infinite value to Almighty God. And all believers are also of infinite value to God. The reason that some Christians are made of less valuable things in this analogy isn't because God made them that way. It's because pastors have made them that way. You see, pastors are the laborers who build the church, which is the body of Christ. Build the house of God. You see that in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 3.9, where Paul told the Corinthians, we are laborers together with God. Ye our God's building. Paul was talking about himself and his co-worker Apollos. And he said, we are God's laborers. You Corinthians are the thing we're laboring on. <laughs> we're God's builders. You're God's building. But the Apostle Paul wasn't your average everyday run-of-the-mill builder. As you see in the next verse in that passage in 1 Corinthians 3.10 where he went on to say, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Paul was a master builder. And the Greek word for master builder, you'll recognize it. It's architecton, from which we get the word architect. Paul was the architect of the church, which is the body of Christ. God gave him the blueprints for the house of God in this dispensation and Paul wrote them down in his epistles. But the reason our King James translators translated architecture as master builder instead of architect is because Paul didn't just design the church. He was what we would call a hands-on architect. He was out there on the job site of the world involved in the actual building of the church. And as the guy who designed the blueprints, he really knew what he was doing when he was out there in the field building the church. But he couldn't build it alone. So men like Apollos helped him. But even in Paul's day, not all the builders knew what they were doing when it came to building the church. Not all of them were like Apollos. So Paul warned them to take heed how they built on the foundation he laid. And he tells us what that foundation is in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 3.11 where he said other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ well now we have to ask 
how could Paul have laid the foundation of Jesus Christ if Paul didn't even get saved till after Jesus Christ was born, died, was buried, rose from the dead, and ascended back into heaven? <laughs> And the answer to that question is that Paul laid Christ as the foundation of a different church for us than the one that God laid for the Jews. In writing to the Jews in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, God talked about the foundation of repentance from dead works and of baptisms and of laying on of hands. The foundation of the church that God laid for the Hebrews folks involved things like water baptisms and the laying on of hands to give men the gift of the Holy Spirit and the foundation of repentance from dead works. And the dead works that God wanted them to repent of were the kind that Tracy read for us in our scripture reading this morning in Isaiah 58. When the Jews fasted just to look like they were fasting to other men so that the other men would think they were very holy. <laughs> and you know what? In the eyes of God, those kind of works were deader than disco. They were dead works. And we know the Jews did other works like that. Because eventually God got so sick and tired of them, he told them in Isaiah 1, 13 and 14, bring no more vain oblations, incense, is an abomination to me. The Sabbaths, it is iniquity. Your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. <laughs> now you think about that. God had told them to bring oblations. Those are all drink offerings. God told them to keep the Sabbath days. God told them to keep the feast days. But when they did it just to put on a religious show, he rejected it. And he told them exactly what he thought of it in your next reference in Isaiah 66 and verse 3. He that killeth an ox as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offers an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol. <laughs> so once again, God had told them to do all those things. He told them to bring lambs for sacrifices. But when they did it for just for a religious show, he looked at it like they murdered a man instead of a lamb. Or sacrificed a, an unclean animal like a dog. And those were the kind of dead works that they needed to repent of. Because the foundation of Israel's church was built on living works. Sacrifices brought in faith instead of religious hypocrisy. But the church which is the body of Christ is not built on the foundation of living works like animal sacrifices brought in faith or any other kind of works done for salvation. Last Sunday we saw the kind of foundation that our church is built on. When Paul said back in your Bible now in the previous verse of our text in verse 19 nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal the Lord knows them that are his and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity 
The foundation of the church, which is the body of Christ, is the foundation of the grace message like we talked about. The foundation that says we became His by faith. And then we do works like departing from iniquity. That's the foundation that Paul laid. But he knew that not all his co-workers would build on it the right way. So once again he told them to take heed how they built on that foundation and then he added in 1 Corinthians 3 12 to 14 if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, the fire shall try or test every man's work. If any man's work abide the fire, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned by the fire, he'll suffer a loss of reward. Now the fire is the fire that Jeremiah talked about in the next reference. Jeremiah 23, 29. God asks, is not my word like a fire. That means that at the judgment seat of Christ the fire of God's word is going to reveal the quality of the work that we do for the Lord. If it's good work it'll abide that fiery trial and be rewarded. But if it's bad work it's going to be burned. And the worker is going to receive a loss of reward that he could have had. Now listen. Don't misunderstand what Paul is teaching there. The vessels that they worked on don't burn. The labor the laborers did to make those vessels will either be burned or rewarded. The Seventh-day Adventist pastor who led Jim Penny to the Lord using Paul's gospel of salvation by grace through faith without works he's going to see that work rewarded at that day because it honored God but afterward when he put Jim under the law of Moses as Seventh-day Adventist pastors always do he's going to see that work burned because it doesn't honor God. It made Jim into a dishonorable vessel who went around telling others that they were under the law. You see, that's the kind of vessel that Paul's talking about here. The kind that not only contains things, it carries them from place to place. Ships are called vessels because they carry cargo and people from one place to another. And Jim Penny not only contained the law in his heart, he became a vessel that carried it to others. And the Bible uses that word vessel that way too as a carrier. If uh, you look at your next reference where Jacob told his boys and Genesis 43 11 take of the best fruits in your vessels and carry down the man a present that was a vessel that carried things right didn't we see earlier that Paul himself was called a vessel a chosen vessel that the Lord chose to, to bear or carry his name to the Gentiles, right? And that's something that all believers are supposed to do, folks. Bear God's name before the world. And listen, even the most earthen of us can do it to some extent, but we should all strive to become vessels that can bring even more honor to God by growing in our understanding of God's grace like Pastor Penny did here at Faith Bible Church. <laughs>
Now as we read on, Paul tells us another way to learn to honor God in verse 21 back in your Bible now. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. One of the ways that a believer can learn to be a vessel that brings more honor to God is by purging himself from something that Paul calls these. <laughs> and listen, the these he's talking about there aren't sins. They're the vessels that dishonor God that he just finished talking about in verse 20, at the end of verse 20. Pastor Penny didn't learn how to honor God more by staying with those dishonorable vessels in the Adventist, Adventist church. He had to purge himself from those vessels just like some of you had to do when you came here from other churches. You wouldn't have grown in grace like you have without purging yourselves from your former churches and your former pastors. When you did that, verse 21 says you became sanctified. And I've told you many times that word means to be set apart unto God. And the verse I love to use, it's the clearest, that shows that is in Exodus 13:12. For God said, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb. Then a few verses later he says, Set apart unto the Lord all that opens the matrix. That's another name for the womb. Do you see how that defines the word sanctify as something set apart unto God, right? When you left those churches and those pastors, you were sanctified, you were set apart unto God, and you became more honorable to God by learning the grace message. And you became meat for the master's use, it says. And you became prepared to every good work instead of just prepared unto some good works like those other sincere pastors prepared you to be. But, being set apart to the Lord, that involves more than just being prepared to do good works, folks. It, invo it involves avoiding bad works too, doesn't it? That's what you see as you read on now in verse 22 back in your Bible. Where Paul tells Timothy, young Pastor Timothy, flee also youthful lust. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, we always think of that word lust as lusting for fornication, right? And the Bible uses it that way. And I am sure that that's at least part of what Paul's telling youthful Pastor Timothy here. <laughs> because he told the Corinthians to flee from fornication too. I didn't give you that reference. You know that verse. And few things will mess up a pastor's life and ministry faster than fornication, folks. But you'll notice there that that word lust is plural in verse 22. Paul is obviously warning Timothy about more than that kind of lust. The word lust just means to have a strong desire for something. Like when Pharaoh said in Exodus 15.9 at the Red Sea, I will pursue Israel. I will overtake them and my lust shall be satisfied upon them. Pharaoh lusted to overtake and conquer the Jews at the Red Sea because of what their God did to him. 
So I think Paul's also telling Timothy to flee the lust that he probably had to conquer those law teachers that we talked about last week for what they did to him. They lured a lot of the members of the church, the Grace Church he pastored, away from grace to the law. And in a minute, Paul's going to tell Timothy to be, to be gentle with them instead of burning to conquer them. So that's another kind of lust that I think he's talking to Timothy about. But I think the primary lust that Paul's warning Timothy about is a lust that he, he's already warned him about in the first epistle in your next reference. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11, where he told Timothy, These things teach, after he gets to the end of the book of 1 Timothy in chapter 6, teach these things. And if any man teach otherwise than what I've taught you, from such withdraw. For they that will be rich fall into foolish and hurtful what? Oh, lust. But thou, Timothy, flee that youthful lust, those youthful lusts. Flee those things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Well, doesn't that sound like the verse we're looking at now? Folks, part of the reason that those, <laughs> those law teachers Lord Timothy's people away to the law is because they lusted for the money that those members from Timothy's church would tithe to their church. And that would make them rich. And they wanted to be rich. They that will be rich. And folks, that is a lust that Paul tells Timothy to flee two times. Once there in 1 Timothy 6 and again here in 2 Timothy. Now I know you could argue that the lust for money isn't just a youthful lust because people of all ages lust for money. <laughs> but hey, people of all ages lust for fornication too. I'll never forget the story a lady told me about her elderly mom who was in a nursing home and had a bad fall. And as the, the paramedics were carrying her out to the ambulance, she was checking them out. <laughs> I kid you not. All lusts are, are stronger when you're young. But following after righteousness will help with all of those lusts. Because righteousness in that context just means doing what's right. And those lusts are usually wrong. And following after faith will help with those lusts too. Because that word faith in that context means faithfulness. And being faithful to the Lord helps with the lust for money and it helps with every other problem you've got sinfully. And following charity that makes you a giver of money instead of somebody who's lusting for more money, right? And following after peace. Well, that helps because this is important too. If you're at peace with how much money you have, you won't be lusting for more money. See how that works? Now, it's always easier to follow after things like that if you have a support group <laughs> that's also trying to follow him. So in verse 22, Paul told Timothy to follow those things with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now who would that be? <laughs> well, the Lord gives you a clue in Matthew 5, 8 when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Well, what kind of people are going to see God someday? Save people! Paul's telling Timothy, follow those things with other believers. 
Now, where would Timothy find a support group of people like that? In his church, of course. And here's the point. If Paul tells a pastor like Timothy to go to church to help him follow those things, do you think maybe going to church will help you follow those things too? Did you ever hear anybody say, you know, the Apostle Paul never tells us to go to church. He does in that verse. <laughs> he says, follow those things with the members of your church. Tells the pastor to go. I <laughs> Paul is telling Timothy, purge yourself of those dishonorable vessels, teaching the law, and take your stand with the honorable vessels of your church. And he says it again in the next verse in your Bible, in verse 23, in a little bit of a different way. Verse 23 in your Bible, he says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Now who do you think would be asking Timothy questions like that? Well, I'll tell you. The only other time the Bible talks about foolish questions that cause strife is when Paul told Titus in Titus 3.9, avoid foolish questions and strivings about the law. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Get away from people who ask questions like that. I couldn't, I couldn't escape them at BBS. I used to hear all kinds of questions from law keepers who'd email me in those days. How come you guys don't go to church on Saturday like the law says? You know why that's a foolish question? It's foolish because we're not under the law that says to go to church on Saturdays. Christians also used to ask me, should I tithe my gross income or my net income? <laughs> and listen, I'm sure that's one of the foolish questions that were being asked at that time too because I'm sure Christians paying taxes to Rome were asking the same question. And that's a foolish question because we're not under the law that says to tithe. And there's another foolish question that men ask about the law. One that uh, I think Paul's hinting at in your next reference in 1 Timothy 6, 3-5 when he says if any man teach otherwise he is proud doting about questions and strifes of words where if come a strife he mentions strife twice supposing that gain is godliness stay away from those kinds of people asking those kinds of questions and the gain that he meant folks was financial gain. If the Jews under the law obeyed God under the law, he prospered them with financial gain, right? So, back in those days, if you saw a Jew who had a lot of financial gain, you could suppose that he was living godly, and you'd be right. But you can't suppose that today. And it's foolish to ask why God's not prospering you if you are godly. And I used to get to ask questions like that too. Do you know why verse 23 calls those questions unlearned? <laughs> it's because if you don't know what God's doing in the dispensation you're living in, you're unlearned. That's what Peter says. In 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, where he talks about our, our beloved brother Paul, hath written in all his epistles things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable twist or rest to their own destruction. Today, in the dispensation of grace, Unlearned Christians are Christians who are ignorant of Paul's epistles. Because his epistles tell us what God is doing in our dispensation. Beloved, there are pastors who graduated 
from hoity-toity institutions of so-called higher learning who are unlearned compared to you. And unlearned pastors like that used to write to me and strive with me over these things in the law. But instead of striving with them, you know what I did instead? I did what Paul told Timothy to do in the next verse in your Bible, in verse 24. Where he said, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Don't get sucked into that. Uh, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Now, don't overlook that beginning part there. The servant of the Lord must not strive. There, there's a reason Paul's telling Timothy what he should do as the servant of the Lord. You see, nearly every other time in your Bible that that exact phrase, the servant of the Lord, every, every time it's used, it's talking about the guy in Deuteronomy 34.5, Moses, the servant of the Lord. And I checked, and Moses is never ha said to have striven or had strife with anybody. Instead, what's it say about Moses in Numbers 12.3? Moses was very meek. Above all the men upon the face of the earth, he was the meekest man on the planet. And you know what? Look back at your Bible. Peek ahead to verse 25 where Paul tells Timothy to be meek instead of striving. Listen, you don't get anywhere <laughs> striving with law teachers. But I can tell you this. When Pastor Penny's Uncle Mitch, remember Mitch Hannock, some of you? When he was gentle with him instead, Jim learned the grace message. And there's another reason, though, that Paul's using that exact phrase, servant of the Lord. It's because there's two other times where it doesn't talk about Moses with that phrase. And one of them's in your next reference, Joshua 24, 29, where it talks about Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. And listen, Joshua was to Moses what Timothy was to Paul. Joshua was the man who carried on Moses' work. And Timothy was the man who was carrying on Paul's work. So in using this phrase, Paul's telling Timothy to not just carry on his doctrine. He's telling him to carry on his work in the meek way that he fought for his doctrine. And that meant being gentle. And if you're not sure what the word gentle means, I think you get a great definition of it in your next reference when Paul told Titus in Titus 3.2, Speak evil of no man, be no brawlers, but be gentle. Do you see how that defines the word gentle? As not speaking evil of somebody and not brawling or fighting with them? You can go around bad-mouthing men who teach the law if you want to. Plenty of grace believers do. You can pick fights with them that end up in the, turning into brawls if you want to. But Paul says you should be gentle and apt to teach instead. Now, that word apt in that context means likely. If I poke Thornton in the eye, he's apt to slap me silly. I wouldn't blame him. And if I start a theological brawl with a, with a guy Oscar size, <laughs> he's apt to squash me like a bug. Well, when men leave the grace message for the law, pa 
masters are apt or likely to strive with them. Paul says that instead they should be likely or apt to gently and patiently teach them. And do what he says in the next verse in your Bible, in verse 25, where Paul says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now who are those that oppose themselves? Well, I think it's the law teachers. The law teachers who were striving about the law of Moses were opposing themselves because they weren't acting like Moses. He was meek. He didn't strive. People strove with him a time or two. But he didn't stoop to their level. And neither should we. But those law teachers were opposing themselves by striving, I think. They claimed to champion the law, but they weren't acting like the author of the law, the guy who wrote the law. Instead, they were acting like the Jews in your next reference, in Acts 15, I'm sorry, 18, 5 and 6. Paul testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And what did they do instead of receiving him? They opposed themselves and blasphemed. Now you think that through. Those hypocritical Jews had been looking for their Messiah, looking for their Christ for 2,500 years. And when Paul told them that their Messiah had come, they acted like they hadn't been looking for their Messiah for 2,500 years. They opposed who they were. They were a people looking for their Christ. Now, here in Ephesus where Timothy pastors, pastor, we know those law teachers were, were saved. Because they, they turned away from Paul to the law, right? So they had to be saved. They, they were saved by grace. They just turned away from it to the law. So they were also opposing who God made them in Christ. Because God made them free from the law. And they were opposing themselves when they went back to the law. And you may not have done that. But since God's also made believers like you and I free from sin. When we choose to live in sin, we're opposing who God made us that way too. We're opposing ourselves. God made us sinless in His sight. When we live in sin, we're opposing ourselves. And verse 25 says the way to help believers who oppose themselves is to meekly teach them if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, that word peradventure is not a word we use very much, if at all. <laughs> but it just means perhaps, by chance, as it does in your next reference. Exodus 13, 17 says, when Pharaoh let the people of Israel go, God led them not through the way of the Philistines, not through Philistia, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. If the people of Israel saw war in Philistia, they might have gone back to Egypt. And they might not have. There was a chance it could go either way. It was all up to them. But now, in verse 25, that makes it sound like it was all up to God if he wanted to give repentance to those who oppose themselves, right? And that makes God sound like a big old meanie who might give them repentance, and he might not. 
It was all up to him. But let me ask you a question. How does God give repentance? If you're not sure, look how God gave repentance to the people of Israel in Acts 5, 30 and 31. Jesus hath God exalted to be a Savior to give repentance to Israel. God gave repentance to the people of Israel by giving them a Savior. And it was all up to them if they wanted to receive the repentance he was giving them. Some of them did. Some of them didn't. That'll match the other time that God talk, that talks about God giving repentance. In Acts 11, 18, after God saved a Gentile named Cornelius, the Jews said, well, then hath God also, he gave us, he granted us repentance, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And you know what's happened ever since then. Ever since then, some Gentiles repent and some don't. It's all up to them. So the thing that determines if God gives repentance to men who oppose themselves is if they're willing to do what verse 25 says and acknowledge the truth or not. It's always been that way. It's always been up to men if they want to repent. Now, if you don't think that's the case, look how Paul finishes our text in verse 26 back in your Bible now. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by the devil at his will. As it says there, believers who oppose themselves can recover themselves, right? It's up to them. And they have to do it because God's not going to do it for them. God can't, and God won't do it for them. And Timothy couldn't recover themselves. They had to recover themselves. And neither can you or I when, when we try to, to help believers who are opposing themselves by living in sin or living in the law. But now, when that verse 26 ends by talking about the thing that they need to recover themselves from, you'll notice it says they need to recover themselves from something Paul calls the snare of the devil. And you know, unless you're a real woodsman, you don't know what a snare is. A snare is a trap. And there's lots of kinds of trap, but a snare is a trap that's got... A, 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 you start with a noose, like when you hang somebody from the gallows. A snare, it has a noose that you attach to the, to the top of a small tree, maybe about that high. And then you bend the tree over until the noose is laying on the ground. Then you attach a trigger to it. And I, and I can't even begin. The trigger is ingenious. I, if I tried to explain it to you, I, I'd look it up. It's, but you attach a trigger to it that will release when the animal steps in the noose. And the critter then is, when the, when the tree snaps up, he's left there hanging until you come pick him up. My grandfather used to trap rabbits that way to put meat on the table during the, de the Great Depression. And the snare that the devil uses to trap believers, folks, is the law of Moses. Do you know what happened to the Jews when they broke the law? God allowed them to be taken captive. Hey, isn't that talked about in our verse here? When they broke the law, God allowed them to be taken captive by the Babylonians. At His will, God's will. It was God's will for them to be taken captive, to punish them, to chasten them, for breaking His law. But today, 
When a believer saved by grace puts himself under the law, he's taken captive by the devil at the devil's will. You say, well, how does that work? Well, Paul tells you in Romans 7, 22 and 23. He says, I delight in the law of God, the law of Moses. That's what he's talking about there. But I see another law in my members, in my body. Warring against the law of Moses. Warring against the law of God. And doing what? And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. As believers, you and I, we delight in the law of God, the law of Moses. We say, yeah, that, that's a really good godly law, the Ten Commandments. I want to obey it. But there's, there's a law in your body. There's a law in the very members of your body that, that bristles when we're told to do good. And it makes us want to do the opposite. That explains what Paul says in the last verse of your handout there in 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The strength of sin is the law of Moses. When you put yourself under the law, you strengthen sin in your life. And that brings you into captivity to that law of sin in your members. And folks, that is Satan's will. That is not God's will. Taken captive by Satan at his will by putting yourself under that law. But now, don't let those words captive and captivity scare you into thinking that it's talking about the devil snatching away your salvation. Paul used that word snare carefully in particular because the snare trap doesn't kill the animal, folks. It just leaves them hanging there. <laughs> captive! The Jews were captive in, in, in Babylon for 70 years, right? And listen, saved Jews like Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, they never stopped being saved. They just weren't able to, to function as saved Jews. They weren't able to bring their sacrifices to the temple like the law said that they had to. They weren't able to go to Jerusalem three times a year like the law said they had to. And believers today taken captive by the devil. We don't lose our salvation either. We just can't function as believers. Function as a believer, you have to quit opposing yourself by living in sin. And try to live like the sinless person you are in Christ instead. And listen, you need, you need to chuck the thing that strengthens sin to do that. You need to get rid of the law in your life. Now, finally, once you know all that, and probably, you would think, a lot of people Timothy taught grace to knew all that. Once you know all that, you have to ask yourself, who would ever fall for the law? Well, the thing about a snare trap is, you can just set it on the rabbit trail, and you know that eventually a rabbit will come by and get snared. But I looked it up. And the internet, which is always right, as we know, the internet says that snare traps work best if you bait them. And let me tell you, Satan knows how to bait a trap. He knows exactly how to bait the trap of the law. The snare of the law. The snare of the devil. He gets preachers to tell believers that if they obey the law, God will make them healthy and wealthy. Because that's what God did to the Jews when they were under the law. And I don't have to tell you, if you know anything about human nature, there is no more attractive bait on planet Earth than health and wealth. <laughs> 
everybody wants it. And Christians found in every kind of church on the planet take the bait. They go following after the law. They're snared by the devil. And when they do, it leaves them hanging there. And Satan has them right where he wants them. In captivity. Unable to function as the believer that God wants them to be. Don't you fall for it. And don't let anybody else fall for it either. Amen? Heavenly Father, we're thankful that somebody shared grace with us. We, we thank you for the memory of Jim Penny. We thank you for the many, memory of Mitch Hannock. Both of them now with you. And how a, a, a dear brother like that, saved by grace, became snared by the devil. Caught up in a religious system that majors on the law of Moses. And they all do to some extent. We thank you for their memory and the love that they had for us and us for them and for the example they give us of the danger of something that was once the, the holy tool, the instrument that you used with the people of Israel, the law of Moses. What a, what a reminder of the importance of what we do here when we rightly divide the word of truth. We, and then finally, Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the answer to the law. Because the answer isn't found in us keeping it. It's only found in, in the grace of God. We thank you for it in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen.